So nice to be with you all on this beautiful Sabbath day and to see your lovely faces. Um, I am very blessed to share the message with you today. Um, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your blessed Sabbath day and for the sunshine and the sunshine in our hearts of your love. Uh, we just thank you that you have brought us together to fellowship together and to hear a message. And we pray that you will bless the words, bless the hearts. May your Holy Spirit be with us right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. So today I named my sermon Peloton Christianity. And uh, um, I hope it will be um, relevant and a blessing to you. Um, so next slide. You know, if you think about what was Jesus's mission while he was on earth, I, I boiled it down to these two things. Uh, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19.10, and in Desire of Ages, uh, Ellen White says, by coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. So um, if you think of that, you know, and, and you kind of, you know, think about it, it was he largely successful? Do, do most men know who Jesus is? And do, um, do, was his mission successful? Some people, yeah, a lot of you say yes. Okay, well, that's good. Um, I was, I'm going to premise my whole sermon on that it, he wasn't that successful. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to have to make my case. Uh, but, um, but if you look at the examples in the Bible uh, of uh, faith, what does faith mean? And who shows evidence of, of true faith? Uh, you can go to the next one. It's, um, and if you read this quote, maybe you'll see who we're going to talk about. Uh, in Luke 7, 9, it says, When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And um, don't know if you all recognize who Jesus was talking about. But let's go on to the next slide. It, he was talking about the centurion. And um, uh, you know, why, why was his faith so lauded by, by Jesus? And because, um, you know, Centurion, he was a person of power. He was in the, uh, he was the ruling class over the subjugated Jewish people. How did he come to this faith, you know? So um, I, today I wanted to think about uh, how, what the process may have been. And, uh, you know, how, Obviously, he had to rise above a lot of prejudices. And, you know, is there evidence that Jesus, Jesus's life and character were making changes in the centurion even before they actually met? So I'm going to make a case for that. Next. Uh, before we do that, I just wanted to point out in, you know, just small background um, knowledge that you may want to kind of plant in your mind right now is that Roman culture, they were not monotheistic, and uh, they were very open to learning uh, from other religions and other cultures. So it was very, very probable 
that he would have been open to the Jewish faith. So, so with that, um, I wanted to, I, I took the liberty of writing out a narrative of what um, the story might have looked like. And um, some things to, uh, next, next slide. So some things to think about when you think about the centurion is uh, some things to look for in my, my little story is how was the centurion able to overcome the prejudices that he would have? And how was he made familiar with the teachings of God? And what was it exactly about his faith that Jesus prays so much. Like other, Christ, like other centurions, Gallus looked down upon the Jewish people that he was overseeing. Their peculiar ways, their strange diet, their lack of generosity of spirit made Gallus scoff at their religion and take satisfaction in his superior gods, comforted by the fact that here was evidence that the Roman rule was better than his, the god of his subjugated ones. Next. But one day, something changed when Josephus, his servant, mentioned something that causes, uh, caught his attention. Josephus came in from the market really excited. He said, Master, I heard this fantastic story that there's a man named Jesus who actually healed a paralytic. Everyone knew about this man who was paralyzed for years and years, and Jesus saw him and told him to take his mat and walk, and he did. I heard that the Pharisees criticized for him for it, but he, it didn't seem to faze him. Master, I really think that he's the son of God. Next slide. And throughout the year, Josephus told Gallus of each story of healing and miracle that Jesus did. And with each story, Gallus's heart was warmed. Is it possible that the Jewish Messiah was here on earth? How compassionate is he? He heals people that have no hope. He gives encouragement and reveals the God that sees their pain and wants to heal them. And the message from the Mount Sermon on the Mount, those ideas just thrilled him. The fact that God really loves everyone especially those who are humble, who are mourning, and that the kingdom of God is his seeking to comfort his children. Well, that was mind-blowing. Slowly, Gallus started to change his views about God. He realized that his servant's God was real and started to read the scriptures. He even studied it with Josephus. His heart was moved to build a temple for the Jews when they needed one. Next slide. But one day, Josephus suddenly took ill and looked to be on the verge of death. He tried to get the physicians to help, but they told him that there was no hope. Gallus was thinking that only God can help his dear friend, and suddenly the thought came to him that God can help him. But when the thought came to him, would Jesus be willing to help him, a Roman centurion? He felt unworthy to even ask, but love for Josephus made him take, step, take the step of asking some Pharisees to ask Jesus to heal Josephus. Next slide. Gallus was thrilled when the Jews told him that they appealed to Jesus and he was willing to come to him to heal Josephus. Instinctively, Gallus became alarmed how could he stand in the presence of such a holy being? He immediately sent a message to the Jews to tell Jesus that he doesn't need to come in person. Gallus wrote in the message, don't trouble yourself to come to this house. Gallus anxiously waited for the messenger to come back to tell him to let him know that Jesus mentally assented to healing to Josephus. But the messenger came, rushed back to tell him that Jesus was still heading his way. 
So Gallus felt compelled to run to Jesus. Next slide. Gallus rushed out and found a large group head, slowly heading his way. Gallus's eyes were instinctively drawn to the man in the middle of the crowd. He was not physically attractive, but there was something in the manner that drew their, your attention. As Gallus ran up to meet him, everyone stopped in their tracks. Next stop, next slide. He stumbled over his words, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Gallus knew in his heart that Jesus had the power to heal. But more than that, he sensed that he had great compassion. This he pieced together from the stories that Jesus, about Jesus that Joseph, Josephus told him. Next slide. But when Gallus actually came into Jesus' presence, he felt the love in Jesus' gaze. With one look, Gallus was absolutely convinced that there was someone who understood him. His heart, his needs, his situation, everything. He was in the presence of the Holy One, the Son of God. And Gallus didn't need to ask if he was willing to heal Josephus. He felt in his heart that there was nothing that Jesus wanted to do more than that. Next, next slide. Another thought came into Gallus's mind. He realized that Jesus knew about his request and could have granted it without coming to him. Then why would he come to him? He's, after all, a Gentile and a Roman centurion. Then he realized with clarity that Jesus came to see him face to face. And he realized that Jesus was speaking to his heart all along. Every time he was moved by goodness, by generosity, that was Jesus' spirit reaching out to him. That strange feeling that warmed his heart and made him see the world in a new way, Jesus was calling him. Gallus felt the answer in his heart. He had come face to face with the spirit that was making the changes in his heart. Next slide. Gallus ran home with a song in his heart, knowing without a shadow of a doubt that Josephus would be healed. He knew that Jesus not only had the power to heal him, but wanted to because Josephus was his precious child. He and Joseph kneeled together and praised the God of heaven who loves all his creation. Next slide. So that was my, my little story. And um, just wanted to point out some things that uh, have a little bit of um, uh, evidence for the things that I uh, spoke about. Um, so this is from Desire of Ages uh, regarding the, the centurion. Um, page 174, he had not seen the savior, but the reports he heard had inspired him with faith. Next slide. In the teachings of Christ, as it had been reported to him, he found that which met the need of the soul. All that was spiritual with him, within him responded to the Savior's words. That was from Desire of Ages as well. Next one. Notwithstanding the formalism of the Jews, this Roman was convinced that their religion was superior to his own. So... Um, I hope that you can see from the, uh, the quotes from Desire of Ages that there was something that was happening in the centurion's heart long before he, Jesus came to actually see him. And um, yeah, just, and I wanted to go, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a, 
from 2 Corinthians 2.2. You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts, 2 Corinthians 2.2. 2. So with, with Gallus, the centurion, he realized that Jesus is the letter that God is sending to the world to show his love. In his words and actions, Jesus revealed the heart of God. Next slide. In Steps to Christ, Ellen White writes, all Christ's children are like letters to the world. If we are Christ's followers, he sends us as a letter to our family. He sends us to the village and to the street where we live. Steps to Christ, page 56. Next slide. Jesus living in us wants to speak to the hearts of those who do not know him. Perhaps they do not read the Bible or hear the voice that speaks to them in the pages. Again, that's from Steps to Christ. So this is the heart of personal evangelism, that we are the letter that God sends to the world so that they would know who Jesus is. Next slide. So um, I wanted to share my little testimony about Peloton. <laughs> so um, I have a very dear friend. Oh, stink bug. Uh, <laughs> um, a very dear friend, a childhood friend, and we meet once, once, once in a while. And when I met her over the summer, she was so excited to tell me about Peloton. And she was saying, oh, this has been so great. Like, it really helps her with her, not just, you know, exercising, but it gives her motivation. It gives her um, accountability. And she loves the music. And would I like to try it? Because she, with her uh, membership, she gets to give out some other people access to her uh, app. So normally I, you know, I was very skeptical, um, but because of my friendship with her, and I've known her for so many years, and I trust her opinion, and something that she was so excited about made me want to try it too. So I said, okay, sure. You know, I'll, I'll, tr I'll give it a try. And uh, up to that point, you know, honestly, I haven't broken out in a sweat in a long time. <laughs> my idea of exercise was, you know, walking around my neighborhood, which is nice, but I never really, like, you know, got the heart rate up or, you know. But, uh, and I started off slowly, but... There I was, sweating. I was like, yay! And, <laughs> and, um, and you know, I, I wrote, I, I texted Moon, this is my friend Moon, and I said, wow, I really love this. Like, this is what I needed. I didn't even know, but it's, it's keeping me on track and um, it really, you know, helps me to do what I wanted to do all this time, and I didn't even know it. And then for us, in our relationship, it, it built a um, kind of like a cornerstone, and whenever she ha has a great class, she'll send me um, the, the little link, and we'll talk about it, and... Um, you know, it's become great for our relationship as well as, you know, my health. So I'm just so thankful for this, um, for her sharing her excitement with me. 
So, so with this Peloton story, I wanted to share what personal evangelism should be for all of us. It's that, that joy. It's that something that is so exciting in your life that you have to share and you want to share. And it's something that is like, because you know that the other person is going to love it and going to be changed by it. So, um, so let's go back to the centurion story. Next slide, please. And this is, this is the key thing that I wanted you to think about. Because when I heard of the, the, the centurion story, I was wondering why did Jesus commend him so much? Because the centurion seemed to be almost bragging about his authority. Like, you don't have to come because, you know, I'm a person of authority. And if I tell him to do this, then he'll do that. Like, you know... Is that confidence in your authority? Is that what faith is? But, you know, reading the story and really thinking about the story made me realize that was not why Jesus commended his faith. This is from Desire of Ages. His heart had been touched by the grace of Christ. He saw his own untrustworthiness, yet he feared not ask help. He trusted not to his own goodness. His argument was his great need. His faith took hold upon Christ in his true character. He did not believe in him merely as a worker of miracles, but as the friend and savior of mankind. So that's why Jesus praised his faith, because even though he had all these prejudices, even though he never met Jesus, he was able to discern that character through the, through the invitations that Jesus had been sending to him all along. Next slide. So if you don't remember anything else from this message, I just wanted to stress this to you. Uh, the centurion was not praised by Jesus because he knew that Jesus could do miracles. Jesus praised his faith because the centurion understood his heart and his mission. The centurion had long recognized Jesus' calling to his heart, awakening him to the love of the everlasting Father. Do you hear that voice calling to you? Every day, Jesus is calling you. He says, I love you, and you are so important to me. If you hear that voice, don't turn away. If you heed that voice, you will find a living spring welling in your heart. And that fountain of joy will spill out to those around you, saying, Jesus lives in my heart, and he can live in yours too. And with that, I will conclude my message and um, pray that the faith that the centurion was lauded for is something that Jesus can say about us, about our faith. 